Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, again, I'm a um, PhD student at the Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen. Um, and I want to talk to you today about a project that's still very much ongoing, but I thought was quite fun, um, which I've given the working title, The Generating Process of Generations, where I, uh, in general, I, I work with these big state registry uh, databases that we have in Denmark, where we have information on all the citizens or everyone who stayed for any prolonged period of time in Denmark. Um, and here I've, I've done some work with the family network, which I think is quite interesting and sort of networking in, in a fun way. Um, so family networks. So oftentimes you're talking about a family tree or your pedigree, stuff like this. And it's quite fun that that's actually one of the oldest ways that people have conceptualized networks, or at least sort of thought about the world in a networky sense, where you are in a social networky sense, where you are connected to other individuals by some kind of relation. For example, this is a example back from the 1300s, where a German um, nobleman, Louis von I can't remember exactly the, the German name, but this is like several hundred years old and th people are still thinking about networks. But this is also simplic like a very clear simplification of reality. Um, and when I started working with family networks, it was sort of the, the picture I had in my mind is that family networks are pretty simple networks. There's this thing of like, oh yeah, I have parents and they have parents and so forth and so forth. Um, and maybe if you push it far back enough, sort of the group of parents will overlap a bit, but nothing major. But as soon as I started working with the actual family relations of Denmark, then I find that it's much more complex than that. Um, but then there's an interesting sort of, there's an interesting observation you can make here in that, okay, we don't observe the, we don't observe the entire history of human development, of course. We actually, in the state registries, only go back to the 50s. And that means when you start in the 50s, you're going to have a bunch of small individual families. And then as time progresses, these families get slightly larger and larger. And actually, if you look at the network now, it's just one big component. So there's the interesting question of, okay, so we start with something small, and then we end with something big and complex. And when does that transition happen? And of course, there are a lot of different ways you can try to look at this. Um, I would say the simplest one is to maybe look at the phase diagram and look at, okay, if we look at how big a proportion of the network uh, is in the largest connect component, um, and then look at that over time. And then you get these really nice sort of phase diagrams um, where you can see that for the longest time, the largest connect component is tiny, tiny, tiny compared to the size of the actual network. And then at a certain point, there is a percolation like phenomenon where the large connect component suddenly makes up a significant part of the network. Um, now that's kind of interesting, but is it surprising? Well, I don't know, this kind of, to answer that kind of question, I usually tend to try and find like a simple null model that we can compare it to. So let's, let's develop a very simple null model. Let's just say for each year, we look at all the people who had a child and all the people who were born, and then we do a configuration type network. That is, let's say this was the observations we had for a given year um, with parents and children. And then we just look at all the relations uh, and we mix them. So as to keep the out degree and in degree of each node the same. So I've dubbed this the yearly configuration model because it's, a, it's sort of what we do. Um, and then we can look at, okay, then do we still get the, the phase transition that we saw before? And yes, we do get it, and we actually get it very, very quickly. So the if these relations were mixed at random, we would almost immediately see a big component emerge. But in the actual network, it takes about 30 years of actually sort of gathering data before we see this big family emerge. Um, so this is too simple, clearly. This like this is way too far from reality. Um, and of course, there's a bunch of different reasons for this. One of them being that we don't have any sense of monogamy. Um, you can think about it this way. Let's say these are the observations we have along the um, 
the horizontal, the diagonal, the, the second axis, we have time. And for some time, now time goes downwards for some reason. But um, these are our observations. And what would the yearly configuration model do? It would, for the first year, the parent nodes would pick a random child node as their child and sort of assign there. And let's just say we sampled like this. Um, then for the second year, we might end up doing something like this. Because each parent at each year is just picking a random, random child among the ones that are born that year, you very quickly end up having people sort of changing partners. By extension of picking a random child, you ran, pick a random co-parent. So here you could see that in the real data, after these two years, we had two components of size four, but now we have one big component of size eight. So you can sort of see how this speeds up the process unrealistically. Well, all right, but we can go through the data and actually look at how many people change partners over time. And then we can just enforce that. And if you first start saying, okay, let's just enforce full monogamy. Just say, okay, everyone, you pick a partner. And once you've picked a partner, you're going to stick with them. And then we can see that we get a much, much slower dynamic than we would expect, or at least than what you observe. So if you do something that's slightly more realistic and you actually enforce the right level, well, you're still getting something that's too slow, apparently, but we're getting there. Um, so it's not just monogamy that plays a role. Um, but then the question comes, then what else are we missing? And definitely, like, I'm sure that a lot of you will have speculated that this is important, but we're definitely missing sort of choice. Right now, whenever someone chooses to have a child in our simple null model, they pick a random child, and by extension, there's a random parent somewhere, uh, a random co-parent. But people don't pick their partners completely random. There's a bunch of cultural and uh, geographical effects that separate people into different clusters. Um, a very simple example is that you can look at age. Here we have uh, for uh, male and female, so this is for only for heterosexual couples, but you can look at the male age and the female age when they first have the, first have a child together. Uh, and then we can just count how many observations we have in each. And note that this is on a log axis. So really this diagonal you see, this is very, very pronounced. More or less all people pick a partner who has about the same age as themselves. Um, so there's a very strong homophilic tendency within age. Another interesting and very strong homophilic tendency we found was in geography, where if you're from an area, if you grew up in a certain area, you're gonna find a partner from there. For example, you can look here. Uh, this is Denmark. And all the small regions you see, these are the municipalities. And let's say you grew up in Roskilde. That's the one that's very yellow here. Um, then we can look at, okay, conditioned on you being from Roskilde and conditioned on you having a child, where did your partner grow up? And this is what how we've colored the this is how we've colored the map. And you see there is this very nice sort of gradient, color gradient across the country, where if you grew up nearby, like you're very likely to find a partner who grew up near where you were, grew up yourself, and the likelihood just decreases as you move further away. Um, and this is actually true for more or less all regions in Denmark. If you are from a bigger city, it seems like you can sort of reach out further, but everywhere you pick someone who grew up in the same location. Um, and this is even if you're conditioned on, okay, what if you go to university and stuff like this, you still see this tendency. Um, so you can summarize it a bit and look at, okay, what is the distance between you growing up in an area or sort of the, if you have, if you have a child with a partner, what is then the distance between the, your, your origin and their origin within the country? Um, and in the blue curve, you see the actual observations. We see there is this sort of, there's a very large tendency that's more than 50% chance that you have a, uh, that you're from the same municipality, this is on a municipality basis, same municipality. And as the distance between municipalities increases, the likelihood decreases. Now, again, one part of this is choice. Another part of it is about population densities and saying, okay, if I'm from a big city, 
a lot of other people are from big cities. There's a high likelihood that I would find a partner there, just if I picked at random. Um, so just by the difference in densities, you could get something that would look like this. But this is what we have in orange. If, if people had picked at random, you would actually get uh, the mode of the distribution being at about 10, 10 kilometers instead of being sort of uh, zero, which means in the same municipality in this case. Um, and an interesting occur thing occurs if you take the ratio between these two, that is for each bin in this histogram, the lines are just for sort of the, making it easier visually to follow. You take the ratio between these two and you plot it on a log, log axis. Then you get this green line, which is actually has a very nice and straight line on this log log scale. So maybe there is some kind of almost power law like structure to it, where you have a you have a um, certain sense the effect of geography, and then you have uh, that multiplied by some kind of bias, which might have some kind of power law like structure, but though this has not been verified further. So. Um, so we have a bunch of different features like this. We've talked about age and geography now. We've also looked at education and income, and we see there are a lot of different homophilic patterns. Um, so to try and summarize this in some way, then we try to do a classification task. It's a good way to get a number of different sort of correlations and get like a good summarizing results of how non-random something is. Um, so let's say we try to do some couple classification. So you can look at the, the actual couples, um, and then you could try and do and randomize them. And we've tried randomizing them in different ways, but let's just keep it to the simplest, simplest thing that we just randomize that everyone picks a random partner who had their first child in the same year as themselves. Um, and then you can try and do classification. Can you, given the features of two people, can you figure out is this actually a couple or is this uh, a fake couple? Um, and you can do this with pretty good precision. Uh, you can get like on a balanced data set, you can get to like 80% accuracy. Um, and then you can look at the SHAP values. And I don't know how familiar what you are with SHAP values. They can be a bit sort of overloading <laughs> to, to, to read if you're not used to it. Uh, so let's just keep Think about this is a way to uh, interpret a classification, uh, a model to do that does classification and figure out how does it prioritize different features. So the most important features seems to be distance between origins of people. It's also what we saw that that was very sort of it's very clear that you find someone from the same area. Um, then difference in age turns out to be very important as we also saw. Then we have difference in education level. Uh, is also found to be important. And then secondly, so lastly, it also looks at the male and the female age. Again, this has been restricted to um, to um, heterosexual couples. We've also looked at homosexual couples uh, and we find mostly the same results. We just have a lot fewer observations for it. Um, so it seems like distance, age, and education are sort of the drivers of separating uh, the, let's say, the partner market into different subsections that you can in some way choose from. Now, all of this is, of course, correlational, and we haven't done, it's kind of hard to do uh, causal studies in this kind of setting. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is something I'd like to get your input on. So actually, the, this is sort of where my uh, the talk ends, and the plan next steps is to get these um, partner correlations, get these into the network models, and then look at how the the the, the phase diagram changes, or look at how yeah, the percolation, or look at how the path distance in the family network changes. And then we also have uh, information on where you went to school, where you went to work, where you've lived, and see if we can figure out, okay, now we know something about who you choose. Can we say something about who you choose among them? Um, so that was the sort of the two next steps. Um, so really, I, I I was hoping to to talk with you about other ideas, what you would find interesting in a project like this, um, and what your thoughts are. So I think that's actually all I have prepared. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um,
Great. Uh, okay, so questions from people online? Uh, I could ask something. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, so I was like, you had this like uh, idea of about, about the percolation. Yeah. And I guess this is like um, just undirected. Yeah, yeah. So or there is, this is all, all looking at it as an undirected graph. If you look at it directed, then you don't really get any big components because that would require cycles and you don't get cycles in family networks. Yeah, but you could still like look at uh, base transitions in the directed way. And I'm sure Abbas can tell you <laughs> more about yep. that because we basically we did uh, for, like this kind of work for temporal networks where we looked at the sort of like directed percolation. Yeah. Uh, so inst instead of like a this kind of uh, undirected percolation, like we had the paper be about that before also on temporal networks, but basically those are like DAX structures that we looked at, and then like how does the when like how does the percolation happen, and and how can we quantify it and so on, and you can see like different transitions there too. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, so yeah, I, that's something if you want to have like a, some more interpretation for this like connectivity that might be something yeah that could be cool yeah that would be interesting or, or i would be also interested to hear if you have some other interpretation of what does this connectivity mean because you can sort of go back and forth in time and directions yeah. or is it just like there were no tools available so what the connectivity means so i guess when i think about the connectivity of it mostly what i think about is sort of um it's an interesting measure of uh, cohesion in society. So I, like, I, I think a lot about it as sort of, okay, what's the path length uh, between, let's say, um, people who work as lawyers or people who work as nurses? Is there like a, is there a different path length between those family-wise than you would see between just nurses, for example, uh, or nurses and doctors? So, so mostly when I think about it, I see it as a way to sort of measure a not- segregation but sort of a cultural separation um between groups but it seems like you might be thinking about something that's slightly more technical than that when you're saying how i no no i mean this is exactly like how do you interpret okay. connectivity yeah. like why why is it interesting to you so you are sort I of think thinking... that would be okay. my sort of reasoning for why this is interesting um and it's interesting that there is i would say when you initially think about it and i think when most people think about it, you have this idea that, oh, you can actually find a partner from more or less sort of anywhere um, if you want. But when you look at how 6 million people actually found their partners, you can see that it's super constrained. It's really, really constrained. And I think this, this network model way of looking at it is a good way to look at, okay, what consequence does that actually have? And how does that sort of shape um, the, uh, the social fabric that we move in? Yeah. So in, in this path length, I sense like the connected components might also not be as interesting, right? So you... It's in a way, it's, it's um, I would say the connect component in itself, it's maybe it's less interesting. I think there's something interesting in the speed of mixing, but it is, I guess you're right. And that's sort of a separate thing. If in this line of thinking of this sort of um, social fabric kind of sense, it's more interesting to look at what is actually the structure of it rather than just is there a component or not. Yeah, so like how modular is it or yeah. something that might yeah. be another another way of thinking about it. Maybe even yeah, doing sure. something. Yeah. Okay, it's another project that we are in with Takayuki. We are working on this kind of DAC clustering. So <laughs> it's also interest, inter yeah. interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so can I ask about the technical definition of this uh network percolation thing so um how how well i probably missed what the you have explained this but i probably missed it but like how do you define edges in this network oh yeah of course so um we work so we work with a a family relation of being have two people been registered to have if you've been registered as a parent of a child 
-hmm. then that's a family relation. Okay. Yeah. And then from that, that's sort of, I guess it's a legal definition, but it's that sort of the, the, the way the, we've been thinking about families. And then from that, you can start getting all the other family relations you might be interested in. Because it all really boils down to who's a parent of who. Then you could say, oh, who's co-parent? Well, that entails that they have a child together. Oh, who's cousin? Well, that actually means that we have to look for your parent and then their parent. And then we go to a sibling and then we go down to, and then yeah, we go to a child, so a sibling of a parent, and then we go to a child. So, so from this, so really we just work with parent-child relations. And then from there, you can sort of build the rest of the family network if you want. And that changes um, the structure, but in this percolation sort of uh, setting, it doesn't change anything. Uh, so when you, for example, uh, when you look at the network in, say, 1990, does that mean it's the population who were alive in 1990? Or like, how? what is the definition of the population and what is the, how are the edges defined in this network? That's... Yeah, so we have, if you, so we've, um, so we did, the plots you've seen here, I do not remove people who are deceased from the network. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a tricky thing, especially if you want to say something about, well, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who might actually know each other? Like, I would still have a relation with, like, I would still know my sister, even when my parents are deceased. Yeah. But there is sort of a boundary where, okay, if it's your great grandparents do you then should that be in the network or not um mm -hmm. we've meddled around with this but haven't found like a mm, good sort of decisive answer for it ah okay so that's what you mean by so basically you take this family network where edges are between parent parent and the child yeah and then just see them as, see it as like an undirected graph and then uh, calculate the percolation. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's what we've done here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Um, so I would be interested, for example, if this speed of mixing has changed over years. Maybe it's not like the time range might not be kind of long enough to see this, but for example, if you start the network from 1950, probably that's the, like the beginning of the, the yeah your empirical data starts, but, but if you instead start, like take the individuals who are alive in 1970 and like look at the family tree uh, emerging from them, yeah. then how would like it, would this like uh, emergence of big uh, cluster, like giant components, will, be, will it be faster or will it be um, slower? Um, um, so from what we've seen, it, it... The might there are it seems like it's fairly stable. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to say because it's it's a um yeah, because once you've so the onset of the percolation seems to be about the same time, if if we mm -hmm. start at different times. Yeah. Um of course it takes about 30 years for it to really sort of start. So we can't yeah. start later than the 90s mm -hmm. uh, right now. Right, yeah. Okay. We have, there's been some talks about whether we could get data further back so we could go back to the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, so then we wouldn't be working with state registries, but with church books. So that would also sort of change. Um, that could also sort of uh, create a shift in its own. But then we would actually be able to say something more about has the speed changed. Mm -hmm. But so <clears throat> you do not remove nodes when people die, right? So the picture... Yeah, have you looked at what happens to the giant component when you remove uh, dead people as time unfolds? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it it changes the it doesn't change the onset behavior. It seems to change sort of the later behavior in the growth of the um, the growth of the network. Essentially, yeah. So, but but sort of the onset of it, sort of the I would say which is also the interesting mixing time in a way um, mm -hmm. that is, that's pretty stable to removing or not removing. And then there's this thing of, okay, maybe you shouldn't remove them when they die. They should be removed 20 years after or something like that. But that's. Yeah. Like <clears throat> I was thinking a lot about the interpretation of these giants as Miko mentioned, B because like, 
<clears throat> I, I I still have no clear understanding of what it does really mean in the physical world. But if we change this data, let's say to citation networks, then mm. we can see that there are like very original papers that they pop up and then there are other papers and they kind of start shaping the, the, the development of science. And as time goes on, at some point you will see that, for example, physics is based on this many papers and there is this giant component which is called physics or there is this giant component which is called chemistry. And then you wait for long enough and then again, these two like things collide but, but but the thing is like that as you are not keeping the directions, it's also something like that when you remove when you don't remove a node, you kind of enforce a lot of connectivity, you know, because because there is no direction back and forth. If you remove the nodes and keep the edges directed then you can see there is, of course, a huge change in time over the in components and out components, right? Yeah. So then then that, that would be very interesting in terms of the physical interpretation of these giants, because you may argue that, for example, for some disease, the genetic family matters. So, for example, there are some tribes that have been developed in a way that they are more either they're like more vulnerable towards some sort of disease than the others. And when they mix, they kind of, the whole family structure from that generation